Well, good evening to you all, and welcome to our evening service here at the Temple Terrace Church of Christ. If you're visiting with us, let us just say that we're so happy that you're here, and we pray that you'll be welcomed warmly, and, uh, and we pray you'll stick around for a little bit to let us get to know you if you are visiting with us. And uh, tonight we have a special treat. Normally at this time, at least for the past couple of months, we'd be doing Bible class right now. But uh, today was the beginning of our gospel meeting with Jordan Schaus, and so tonight we're going to be hearing from him, and we're all very excited about that. Uh, if you were here this morning, you know that Jordan is just a fantastic speaker, did such a wonderful job. I don't know about you, but, but that picture at the, the, the beginning of his sermon, uh, where he, he talked about the Chilean miners that were trapped underneath the earth's surface and how... They needed to step in and be lifted up, and how he connected that to the idea of us being saved by grace. What a powerful picture that was. Uh, looking forward to more of what he has to say tonight and for the rest of this week. I know he'll do a fantastic job. I do want to mention one thing. Uh, for those of you who are parents, I want to let you know that if your kids are back there in their classrooms, the first bell is going to ring after um, the, uh, the invitation song. Is that correct? I'm, w I'm looking for Don. I don't see him. There you go. Yes. Okay. You're not Don, but you give me a thumbs up. I'm going to go with it. So the first bell will ring after the invitation song. So make sure, make sure you're aware of that if you're a parent. But looking forward to studying in the Word of God with you tonight and with Jordan. It's going to be wonderful. Let's, let's bow in prayer before we do that. Dear Lord, our God, we thank you so much for the time we have. We come now before you to open up your word. What a wonderful blessing that is. How lost we would be without, without this precious book, without the wonderful teachings within it, without the story of Jesus and how he came to save us. How terrible it would be to live in this world without it. Thank you so much for, for this book, and thank you so much for Jordan, for him coming here. We thank you for his study and for his dedication to your word. And we, we pray that you'll give him, you'll give him a, a, a great ability to deliver his message tonight in a way that we can understand with great application so that we may leave this place better equipped uh, to serve you with our lives, better equipped to understand and live within the grace that your son Jesus has given us. Please be with those who are sick among us and be with those and comfort those who are sad among us. We ask all these things in the name of your son Jesus. Amen.
Good afternoon, everyone. Glad to see you here tonight. We're going to be in Titus chapter 2, if you open your Bibles there. Titus chapter 2 is the main place of our study, and I invite you to make your way in your Bibles and be prepared to read and study along from the Word of God there. I hope you had a wonderful afternoon, a restful afternoon. It has been such a wonderful day of worship. I'm so thankful for the way that you worship God, for the way that your love for God just shines forth through the way that you sing and that you worship the King. It's been a blessing to be with you. I'd love to pour forth more, more of those kind of words, but we got to get to business. we got to get done before those fifth graders storm through the door. So we're going to get to work, but I know that I'm thankful that you're here. For any of you guests who are here, I'm glad you're here. And I hope you're ready to dig deep into a study of God's wonderful and marvelous grace. Forrest Finn, at the age of 80 years old, decided to do something adventurous. He decided at 80 years old to bury a treasure out west between Santa Fe, New Mexico, and the Canada border out in the Rocky Mountains. It was no small treasure. It was a treasure that amounted to over $2 million. After burying the treasure, he self-published a book called The Thrill of the Chase. In the book, he provided a poem, and then he provided a map, both of which he claimed were exactly what one needed to find the treasure, and it became an overnight sensation. Thousands of people through the U.S. flocked out west to try and find forest treasure, but a decade had passed and no one had found it yet. In fact, in 2016, he appeared on the Today Show, and he assured people, it's not a hoax. I really did bury this treasure, and everything you need to find it is going to be found in that book I provided. But he also said, if I die, the secret goes with me. There's kind of your challenge there. Well, last year, June of 2020, the treasure was finally found. A man took a selfie with the box, claiming that he had found Forrest's treasure. And Forrest commented, saying, I, I don't know who found it. I, I never met the man before. But I do know that the only reason he found it was because of the poem in the book and the map that I provided. Good brethren, you and I tonight have access to one of the most enriching treasures that exists. Far more valuable than gold or jewels or Forrest's $2 million dollars. We call it a lot of different things, but it's become famously known to us as God's marvelous and amazing grace. The Word of God is described to us as the Word of His grace. Or I like what Paul says in the book of Acts chapter 20, verse 24, the gospel of His grace. In your hands, in your lap tonight are the words, the book, the map to unlock this amazing treasure that will make the difference in your life. And as you see in Acts 20, verse 24, grace puts good in the good news about a God who loves us too much to abandon us, to let us go, but instead He gives what means the most to Him, His Son, so we could be free, we could be redeemed, we could be saved. We're asking the question this week, what's so amazing about grace? What's so amazing? And I hope by, by now you could answer that. 
But as we explore each night, we're going to be adding more and more elements as to what God reveals about His grace. Tonight, we're, we're making the statement, God, God's grace isn't cheap. It's a free gift, but it isn't cheap. We started this morning by defining grace in a simple term by saying that grace is a deliberate decision to give something good to someone who doesn't deserve it. We, we can't earn it. We can't deserve it. We can't be good enough. We can't do enough. God simply gives the good things that He gives because He is kind, He is generous, and He is loving. Well, you know, there, there's a lot of questions that come to our mind associated to grace, and one of the common questions that pops up is, if, if God is so forgiving, if God is so gracious, if God is so willing to forgive us, then can I just kind of live how I want to live, do what I want to do, and then he'll just forgive me for it? Can I live like the world? Can I just engage in all sorts of activities since I know he's so willing to forgive me anyway? So I read a blog about the show The Bachelorette. Hear that again. I read a blog about The Bachelorette. (laughs) And on the show, this one contestant who was pursuing the the main lady. I get all this wrong, but he was pursuing the main lady. She had been seen on screen praying and talking about God, and and he was real concerned. He was concerned about this contestant's sexual purity, and so he confronted her about it, and this is what she said. She said, I can do whatever. I sin daily, and Jesus still loves me. It's all washed, and if the Lord doesn't judge me, and it's all forgiven, then no one can judge me. Now we talk this morning, and and we know it to be true from passages like Romans chapter 5 and verse 8, that there is nothing we could do that would make God love us more or less than what He loves us right now. But I think you see there's something different between that and what this woman is saying. What this woman is claiming is, I can do whatever it is I want to do. I can live however it is I want to live because, well, at the end of the day, God's just going to forgive me. So I can speak like the world, act like the world, live like the world, and it doesn't matter because because at the end of the day, God's just going to forgive me. Is that how we should see God's grace? Should we see the, as as Paul would describe it, the abundance of God's grace as a license or a liberty to live however it is we want to live? And this is not new. It's not new to our times. There's a question that Paul posed in Romans chapter 6 and verse 1 when he said, what should we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may increase? Just keep on sinning so that God's grace will be poured out more and more and more. Or Jude, Jude in verse 4, where where Jude writes, Certain individuals whose condemnation was written about long ago have secretly slipped in among you. They are ungodly people who pervert the grace of God into a license for immorality. And they deny Jesus Christ, our only sovereign and Lord. Is that how we're to see this? God in His infinite love, His abundant grace, gives us all the forgiveness, all the liberty, the leeway to live how we want to live. And so that takes us to Titus 2. We're going to read it together. I want you tonight, we're going to read from Titus chapter 2, beginning in verse 11. But I want you tonight to ignore the chapter marking. We're going to go right through into chapter 3. And I want you to catch the bigger section here. Titus chapter 2, beginning in verse 11. Here's what he says. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires, and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in this present age, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Christ Jesus, who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed, and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds." These things speak and exhort and reprove with all authority. Let no one disregard you. Remind them to be subject to rulers, to authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good deed. To malign no one. To be peaceable, gentle, showing every consideration for all men. For we also once were were foolish ourselves disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, spending our life in malice, envy, hating, hateful, and hating one another. But when the kindness of God our Savior and His love for mankind appeared, He saved us. Not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to His mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out upon us richly, through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that being justified by His grace, we would be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Amen. What a rich section here. Did you notice how it all began? A powerful phrase. For the grace of God has appeared. Well, how did it appear? In what way did it appear? When did it appear? 
You know, he answers it down in verse, in verse 13 and 14 when he says, Jesus Christ, our Savior, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us. That's what Paul is saying. We know God's grace. We have seen God's grace. We have tasted God's grace. And it's not through life in general. It's not through all the good things he showers day by day. We know grace. And the way that we know it, the way that God showed his love and his favor, Jesus. Jesus, the Son of God, the Savior of the world. You know this from 2 Corinthians. We looked at this this morning. 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. How? How do we know His grace? How did God show us His grace? How did He demonstrate to the world His gracious nature? Well, Jesus Christ. That though He was rich, yet for your sake He became poor, so that you through His poverty might become rich. Jesus. He gave us Jesus He gave us his son. We know the goodness and the love of God because he gave us what meant the most to him. How do you know God's love? How have you tasted his kindness? Six hours, three nails, one cross, the blood of the lamb slain for the sin of the world. You know, in a lot of ways, our life is kind of like a book, kind of like a journal. And everything we've done and everything we've said is, is there, written in ink, written for us to remember. And we can go back, and, and there's things within the memory of our life that we have lived, and we go back and we see those successful, successful moments, the triumphs, the victories through, through God's goodness. But found in the pages of our past are things that bring us great shame, the things we've done, the things we've said, the way that we've acted. Can, can you imagine, though? Can you imagine handing God our book, the story of our life, of all the things that we've done there etched in ink. And yet over all the places that we know, we know what it says. We know it. That I lied. And I cheated. And I lusted. And I was mean. And I was rude. And I was abusive. And I was lazy. And I know those words are there. But for God to open the book of our life and to see those pages, and instead of the list of sins which we have committed in their place is red ink etched through those sins, and on top is simply the word forgiven. Forgiven. That God can look at us and and call us and claim us innocent, not guilty, because of the blood of the Lamb. We've all sinned. We have all fallen short of the glory of God and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by His blood to be received by faith. That's why so many of us have rightly defined grace as simply this. It is God's riches at Christ's expense. The goodness of God shown, demonstrated, poured forth through His Son. We know love. We know grace through this. And the question we ask, if you've been there and you read those passages, is why? Why? Why would He give Jesus Jesus for me. Why me? Why would he give what meant the most to him, his only son? Why would he put him on the cross? Why would he send him to his death for me? And then we get that verse, that simple yet profound summary of God's amazing grace and gospel, which says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. I love the story of a mom and dad who were sitting at the table and their little boy was there and they were eating and the little boy blurted out, Jesus died on the cross. It's obvious something from Sunday morning stuck with him. And they said, well, that's right, buddy. Jesus did die on the cross. But why did he die on the cross? And all his little four-year-old brain was thinking and thinking and thinking. And then he finally said, "Well, well, he died on the cross because he couldn't come down. That's really profound, isn't it? He died on the cross because he could not come down. Do you know that song, How Deep the Father's Love for Us? Do you remember that phrase? It was my sins that held him there until it was accomplished. Why did he die on the cross? Why did he stay on the cross? Why didn't he call those angels? Because he loved us. Because he would rather die, he would rather suffer a fate, even the cross, than live in eternity without us. Yes, the grace of God is called a free gift, but my brethren, the price, 
the price to set us free, the price to forgive us our sins, the price to secure our salvation cost our God immensely. And so to say that grace is a license to sin, I can do what I want to do because there's grace for that. Because God would forgive me. It cheapens the grace of God. It tramples over the blood of Jesus. It is pursuing the very thing that brought about my death and his death. And as we just read, to see grace as a license to sin misses the purpose of grace entirely. Because here in Titus 2, Paul walks through what grace is all about. The purpose of it. Why God poured forth that grace. Here's number one. The purpose of grace was to redeem us from that which was old. You see it in chapter 2 and verse 14. That Jesus gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed. Our God could not just turn a blind eye to our sin. He couldn't sweep it under the rug. He couldn't ignore it. Not if he wanted to be and continue maintaining to be a just God. But when Jesus gave his blood, when Jesus offered himself, we might find passages like in Romans chapter 5 and verse 9, much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. How do we sing that? To on that cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. For every sin on him was laid. Here and the death of Christ I live. Justice and mercy, it was all met. Those six hours, those three nails, that one Friday night. We might say it this way through Revelation chapter 1 and verse 5 when it says that Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, the ruler of the kings of the earth to him who loves us and has freed us from our sin by his blood. Freed us, our liberty, our freedom from sin, from, from Satan, from the way of life, the old way of life, secured, purchased. We use the word ransomed by Jesus. That's what redeemed means. We are purchased by his blood. Jesus Pay the price to set us free. Now think about that for a minute. I know you've heard that before. We've got good Bible students here. We know redemption is to pay, to pay for something, to buy something. You and I have been freed. The price was paid for our eternal freedom by the blood of Jesus Christ. The blood of the Son of God. You know what that would mean to you and I? In one sense, it, it's a reminder of just how valuable we are to God. I mean, Peter makes it quite clear in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18. He says that you were not redeemed. You weren't purchased with perishable things like silver or gold from your feudal way of life, inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood as of a lamb, unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. It's so easy to buy into the lie of Satan, to look at our life and to look at the lens of our heart and to think, I know what I've done. I know what I've done, and I know how I've broken God's heart and I've broken God's law. There's nothing good in me. I'm just such a broken vessel. There's no, there's, no, there's no reason God would love me. There's no reason someone like me would be, would be worthy of heaven, would be worthy of, of salvation. Not me. And yet Peter says, you're worth the most precious thing that exists. Far more valuable than anything here on earth. What means the most of God was given for you. There's a story of, of a boy who, who built a boat all on his own little sailboat. And so he built it, and he crafted it, and he signed his name on the back, and then he did what you do with a sailboat. You don't keep boats in the house. He took it outside, and he took it to a little stream, and he put that boat on the water. And he had a little string, and he undid it, and he held on to that string, and he just watched his little sailboat float. And oh, he was so proud. He was proud because it floated. And he was proud because he built it. That's my boat. Well, he wasn't ready for the day because there was a big gust of wind that came through. A storm was blowing in, and that wind got behind that boat, and it started to push and to push, and that little string wasn't ready, and that string snapped, and he had to watch his boat just float down the stream. Well, the next day, he was walking through town, and he came to a pawn shop, and there in the window was his boat. And so he ran inside, and he said, hey, hey, that's my boat. I made that boat. That's my name on that boat. And the owner said, well, I'm sorry. Finders keepers. If you want that boat, you got to buy it back. Well, he didn't have any money. So he ran home. And whatever he could do, he was going to do. He mowed the yard. He did the dishes. He bathed the cat. Whatever it was, it was going to be. To be able to make some money real quick, he did it. And sure enough, in two weeks' time, he had enough money, and he ran right back. And he went to the shop, and he bought the boat. Oh, he carried that thing home in his arms, and he walked every step of the way looking down at that little boat. And just before getting home, he stopped and 
And he looked at this boat and he says, you were so special to me. I made you and I bought you. You are twice mine. Satan would love for you to believe that you're worthless. That there's no value to us because of the way that we've lived. Brethren, our God looks at us so differently. He looks at you and he looks at me and he says, I made you, you. I fashioned and I formed you in your mother's womb. Everything about you is carefully and creatively made. And it so broke my heart when you left, when you went your own way, when you chose to walk away from me. But I gave Jesus for you. I gave my son for you. I made you and now I have bought you. You are twice mine. No matter where you go, no matter how far you fall, you never forget how much you mean to your God. We are worth the blood of Jesus to our Father. It ought to remind us also just how, how responsible we are to God because, well, because He bought us. We are, we are His. And that's kind of the point that Paul makes in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 when he says that, that He has bought us with His blood and therefore He has a right to tell us what it is we can and cannot do with our life, with our minds, with our bodies. He owns us. He has a right to determine what it is we do with His life. And that kind of takes us to our second purpose of grace and that is not just to redeem us from the old but to purify us into something new. Go back to Titus 2. Titus 2 and in verse 14, that he gave himself to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession. It was not the plan of God to forgive us our sins, to take away the stain and to say, all right, go your way. Make your way through life. We'll see if I see you at the end. That was not God's plan. Take away our sin and then leave us as free agents roaming the earth. It was always God's plan to remove the sin and then to make us something new, to transform us, to make us into something better, to make us fully and completely into his image. And we see that here in this context, what that means. In part, it looks like avoiding the things that brought about our death in the first place. And so we see in verse 12 of Titus chapter 2 that we are instructed to deny ungodliness and worldly desires. To deny it. Anything that opposes God. Anything. Anything. Anything that endorses evil. Anything that supports sin. It's out of our life. Deny. Reject. Remove. It's from our life. Do you know what the grace of God teaches us? The grace of God teaches us that there is nothing the world could offer us that could compare to what we have in our God. we got a lot of young people and you need to hear that tonight. There is nothing the world could possibly offer you no pleasure, no power, no possession. There is nothing Satan could offer you that would ever possibly compare to what you have in King Jesus. I'm rejecting the old. I'm abstaining from the sin. Keeping away from anything, anything that would take my life far from God. But then did you catch the harder one in chapter 3 and then verse 2? Whew, and he wrote this before Facebook. Malign no one. Your verse may say, speak evil of no one. Question, my brethren, who does no one include? Everyone. Everyone. Speak evil of no one. No one. Which means even those who disagree with us, even those who think differently about COVID, and protocols with COVID, and masks and vaccines, and everything related to everything the past 18 months. Even those who align differently politically, and vote differently, and speak out differently. Even those who are very differently personality, very demonstrative, very aggressive online or in person. Even those who align themselves as my enemy. Do you hear what Paul's saying? Speak evil of no one. Or, let's put it in 2021 terms, text evil, post evil, behind the back secret group text evil, about no one, no one. Can you see what the grace of God teaches us? I mean, in one sense, as we just looked, the grace of God reminds us just how valuable we are because God gave what meant the most to Him for us. 
But it wasn't that God just gave the grace, the blood, the life of his son for me. God gave his son for the world. And so the grace of God reminds me how God sees the world. He sees everyone. I wonder, good brethren, I wonder if perhaps before I would sling those negative arrows at people who seem so aggressive in my life. Oh, I can't stand them, all those people. Do you know what he posted today? Do you know what she shared out out loud? I mean, she was just here on Sunday, and she shared it this afternoon. I wonder if before I would get so upset and tear them down in my mind and pursue tearing them down in public, if I would remind myself that Jesus died for him, Jesus went to the cross for her. God really loves him, and God really loves her. I wonder if that might calm us down and remind us that if God loves them, I need to love them too. I can't speak evil of them. And maybe the reason that hurts so much, good brethren, is because of Titus 3 and verse 3. Because I used to be there. That used to be me. I used to live that way. I used to be real aggressive. I used to be mean. I used to be hostile. I used to be real mean. I used to use my Facebook as a billboard for Satan. I used to let my life be an endorsement for all evil kind of behavior. But something changed along the way. And did you notice what it was? It's not that the law changed. Now that wrongs become right. That's not what happened. Something changed, and it changed me completely. It's a word that has now popped up two times in this short context, in Titus chapter 3 and in verse 4, and in Titus chapter 2 and verse 11. Did you notice the word appeared? Appeared. It's not when I pursued it. It's not when I saw it. It's not when I tried to climb to God's grace and reach it through righteous living. The grace of God appeared and everything in my life changed. You know, you know what it looks like? It looks kind of like this. John 1 and verse 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory. Glory as of the only begotten from the Father full of grace and truth. We sing it this way. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. When at the cross the Savior made me whole, my sins were washed away and my night was turned to day because the fullness of grace and truth, heaven came down and everything changed. There's a story of a a mother who had a son in college. She did everything she could to put him into college and so she went to visit him in the fall and she went to his dorm room and to her horror, all along the walls of his dorm room were pictures of scantily clad women and she was so embarrassed. Well, she went home not knowing what to do, what to say. At holiday, at Christmas time, she couldn't visit him. She didn't have enough money, and so she just sent some gifts to him. And one of the gifts she sent him was a a dime store picture of John 3, 16. It was powerful words just put on a simple poster. Springtime came, and she had enough money to go and visit him. And so spring break, there she went, and she went to go visit her son. And as she went to the dorm room, oh, she cringed as she opened that door, not knowing what she was going to see. But to her surprise... All the pictures were gone. Not a picture was on his walls except for the poster of John 3.16. She had to say something, so she said to her son, well, well, son, I I can't help but notice that your room looks a little different than last time. And said, well, mom, ever since Jesus came in, all these other things just didn't seem to fit. Did you see that in Titus 2? The grace of God appeared... I I, I saw it. I heard that gospel message. I saw that cross, and I saw that it was for me. That was my sin he died for. I saw that love, and I saw that blood. And ever since Jesus came in, all those other things, those old habits, those old thoughts, those old friends, they didn't fit anymore. I couldn't keep on that old way, not since the grace of God, not since my Savior appeared. And so the grace of God is changing us into someone new. That means it's, it's teaching us to avoid those things that brought about death in the first place. And it also means that we are pursuing then, actively engaging in the things that bring about life. 
And so he says in chapter 2 and verse 12 that we are to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age. He wrote that before 2021. So today it sounds like this. In 2021, the people of God are in control of their mind and their time and their money and their habits. They're not, they're not conformed to the world, but they're transformed. They live different. They dress different. They speak different. They are godly even in a wicked and perverse world. In chapter 3 and verse 1, it says, Remind them to be subject to rulers, to authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good deed. Under any, uh, any, under any administration, any government, even if I don't like them, even if I didn't vote for them, I'm a good citizen. And so, I obey the laws of the land so far as they obey and submit to the will of King Jesus. I will not use my tongue to lash out against someone, no matter who they are. That's verse 2. No matter any elected official, whether it's here, local in this area, or up in Washington to itself, I'm a good citizen, and I obey because I recognize my real citizenship is in heaven. And then he says in chapter 2, and then verse 14, and then chapter 3, And then verse 1, that ever since Jesus came in, what he left behind was this burning zeal that I've got to use what time, what energy, whatever opportunities God has brought into my life for his good. I am active in good deeds, seeking the will of God in my generation. I am pursuing the things that bring life, the life of God. Proverbs chapter 20 and verse 9 asks a question I want us to consider for a moment. Because really what you see, let me take it off. I want to come back here in just a moment. We got time. We're, we're doing good. We're rocking our, our kids back there. They're good. We, we got some more time. So I want you to stay with me for a minute. What you see in Titus 2 and chapter, in Titus chapter 3 is not merely Jesus saying, I want to take away the bad in your life, and I want you to do a couple good things along the way. What you see in Titus 2 and in Titus 3 is a change of identity. A complete shift in our identity. Nothing determines who it is we are, our value, What it is we believe we're capable of more than what it is we claim we are, our identity. Can I share with you a struggle I think we have? I think we do this innocently. I think we've done this accommodatively. We've grabbed on to an identity, brethren, that I think we need to let go of. Because it doesn't fit with the purpose of God's grace. Have you heard things like this said before? I'm a mess. I'm just a mess. I'm just broken, just who I am. I'm a sinner. I'm a sinner, and this is just a room full of sinners. I'm just a spiritual mess, but I'm God's mess. You heard that before? I think we say it to be accommodative, but brethren, it misses what Paul says here in Titus chapter 2. Because Jesus did not come to take away our sin and to leave us sinners. He didn't come to us in our blindness to leave us unable to see. What do we say? I once was blind, but now I see. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was broken, but now I'm mended and whole. I once was an enemy of God, but now I'm adopted to his home. I'm a son or a daughter of God. I was a sinner, but now I am a saint. I'm a saint. Oh, you can't say that. How righteous do you think you are? Saint? Well, it's not because I'm so good. It's not because I've done so much that's good. It's not because I've memorized Leviticus. Haven't done that yet. Still working on that one. But it's not because I've done that. It's not because I've worshipped so perfectly or lived so righteously. Because as the question I have on the board, which one among us, good brethren, can say that I have made my, part, my heart pure and I'm cleansed from my sin on my own? I've done it. Me, me. I'm clean from my sins because of how I live, my righteous living, my righteous worshiping. I am clean because of what I have done. Not one of us, not one of us can. The only reason I can say I'm a child of God, the only reason I can claim to be forgiven, the only reason I can say I'm adopted into his family and I'm heaven bound is not because of anything about me and my living and my righteousness. No, it's none of that. It is because of the grace of God. By his grace, I am what I am. We might say it this way. By the grace of God, I'm not who I used to be. Praise God. But I know today I'm not all that I can be. And so until my day comes, I'll continue to press on. 
And it's not through my goodness. It's not through my strength. No, nope. every opportunity, every open door, every blessing that God brings into my life to be useful in his service. Notice, we know the first part of this verse, but notice the end. Anything and everything I am able to do and achieve for the service of God is the grace of God working in and through me. Brethren, if I keep on claiming that identity that I'm nothing but a sinner, nothing will ensure that I will live more like a sinner. I'm not perfect. 1 John 1 and verse 8 says, if we claim we have no sin, we lie. We deceive ourselves. And so I'm not going to make it perfect. But I'm not who I used to be. That's Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3 and verse 3, that I once was a certain way. I once lived a certain way. I was lost. I was deceived. I was blind. But everything changed now that Jesus has appeared. And today, I can claim by his grace, I'm his. I'm saved, I'm adopted, and I'm heaven bound. It's said of, of my generation that we know the price of everything and yet the value of nothing. It's kind of profound, isn't it? We know the price of everything and yet the value of nothing. Is there anything in all existence that you would give everything for? Let me ask it again. Is there anything that exists today that you would give everything everything for. Do you remember that treasure in the very beginning? Forced two million dollars? Well, in the decade span that he went and hid it in those Rocky Mountains, there were four men who gave their lives trying to find that treasure. They lost their lives. They died on the hunt trying to find a treasure that in eternity would amount to nothing. Nothing. Let me ask you this, this evening, what what is the grace of God worth to you? How much is it worth to you? Or maybe to ask it this way, what would you give for the grace of God? What would you give for a second chance? What would you give for a renewal? What would you give for a love of God that would cleanse you and renew you and see you through home heaven bound with your king? Paul says the only and the right response to such a love and to such a, gi a, a gift is this. The love of Christ controls us, having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died. And he died for all, that they who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. It's this, love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. The only acceptable response to such a love and such a gift is your all. Come bring your life to Jesus. Bury the old man in baptism. Put it away. That old life of sin, that life that is tainting and destroying everything that you love, you put that to death and you put it behind you and you come to the king. And you come not just to be forgiven, not just to get renewed. You come bringing your life. I'm ready to follow you. And if that's you tonight, this is a great time to do so. If you've not started your journey with Christ tonight, it's the night to do that right here, right now. If we can help you begin your journey, turning from your sin, putting Christ on in baptism, leaving here a child of God, this is the place and this is the time to do so. But if you're here tonight and you need some encouragement and some help in your walk with God, we would love to help you. Whatever it is we can do to be a blessing to you, right here's where you need to be. Let's stand. Let's sing.
Well, that woke you up. Good to see everybody this afternoon, along with the sentiment that Jonathan expressed at the beginning. We welcome all of you. If you're visiting, welcome. We have several folks who fall in that category tonight, some of you with us for the very first time with our church family. We hope it will not be the last. Hope you can be with us again. Our reusable sermon times on Sunday, we meet at 9 o'clock for our worship period on Sunday morning, and then typically on Sunday afternoon at 5, we have our classes. Just a couple of things real quickly tonight. The announcements for our church family were on the screen. There's no need to repeat what you can read there. Let me give you one quick update, and that's regarding uh, Debbie Vandermeer's brother-in-law. This is Corinne's uncle, um, and it was announced this morning he was having a heart procedure as we were meeting this morning, and that went well, and we're thankful for that. Debbie, in the last year or so, has lost her mother, lost a sister. It's been a very, very difficult and challenging time, and so we want to continue to pray for this family. Appreciate all of our students being with us today. Hope you have a wonderful start to your week tomorrow. If you're visiting with us via live stream, thank you for being with us as well. And Jordan, thank you for your great work today. Just a wonderful beginning to our gospel meeting. Such an important topic for us to think about, to think about, to revel in, to study the grace, the grace of our God. Reminder that we'll have a morning session tomorrow at 10 o'clock, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. And we hope you can be with us in. We always have a good number of folks who are able to be with us in those morning sessions, and then again tomorrow night at 7 o'clock, and we look forward to that. At the end of Jordan's lesson this morning, he played a clip from Dee Bowman. And as you know, we, you've seen, I'm sure, in many places through many sources that Dee passed away this week on Thursday. His funeral will be tomorrow morning at the Southside Church in Pasadena, Texas, where he has been for the past 45 years. And if you would like to live stream that service, just go to their website. You can Google Southside Church of Christ, Pasadena, and you'll be able to live stream that memorial service if you'd like to be a part of that. So good to see all of you tonight. We're going to sing a verse of a song, have our closing prayer, and then we'll be dismissed. Jesus, draw me here. Jesus, draw come before our great God, thanking you for every blessing of life. We pray now, Lord, that you shower down upon us your grace so that when we stand before your throne, pure and clean, that you will hear our prayer. We thank you, Lord, for every blessing of life. We pray that you watch over those who are sick, that you will comfort them, and that you will heal them. And we pray for all those who are mourning loved, lost loved ones, and we pray that you comfort them as only you can. We thank you, Lord, for every blessing in life. We especially thank you, Lord, for the blessing of your son, Jesus, and his, the spiritual blessings that we enjoy through him in this avenue of prayer, the, the blood that he shed that covers our sins, and the hope of home in heaven that you have promised us if we remain faithful. Thank you, Lord, for all things. We recognize that all these good and great things do come from you. We pray, Lord, that uh, as we depart from this place, that you will guide, that you will guard, and you will direct us in our lives so that we can remain faithful to you in all things, so that we may have a home in heaven with you. For this is our prayer in Christ's holy name. Amen. <laughs>